Hello and welcome to episode 49 of the Market Maker podcast and stay tuned for next week, episode 50. We do have a little special something happening. I'll explain more at the end of the episode, so you're going to have to stay tuned for now. But yeah, to mark the 50th occasion, there will be something happening, rest assured. But before I begin, as ever, I've got um, the co-founder, head of trading, Piers Curran, with me. We're going to go over some of the major news of the week first, a couple of highlights from across the board, really, from single stock to macro to a bit of celebrity gossip I've got Ooh. for you this time, Piers, as well. So going to go through that first. Then we'll talk real turkey about US inflation. We'll talk about Fed pricing. We'll talk about um, how equities have been performing under the, the kind of provisor of high yields in the future. And then, we'll, of course, we've got to talk about Boris Johnson. Another um, headache has emerged amongst other things. And so we'll try and break that down as to, A, what's going on? B, are we going to have a new prime minister? And then C, the markets even care at this point. Uh, and some of the subsequent timelines on that. So start things off then, a couple of highlights from the week. Uh, real roller coaster, really, for equity markets. I'm looking at my charts now. The Dow is back down nearly 400, the NASDAQ selling off again. We've gone through a period of where at the beginning of the week, the NASDAQ had had five straight losses on the back of how we performed the end of the prior week. And then we had this almighty bounce, and reports were the retail crowd. They love it stepped in and bought $1 billion of stocks, apparently, on Monday alone. Um, but helping support a little bit of that kind of more midweek bump was Jerome Powell. Um, he had kind of one of his hearings with the Senate Banking Committee. Just this is kind of the formality of the approval of his next term as the Fed chair. And as much as he committed to the fact that really markets are right, high, rates are going to go up sooner rather than later, he did push back about this idea of the shrinking of the balance sheet. And that was quite critical. Tech loved it at the time. They're not loving life so much now, but very <laughs> briefly had a little bit of a relief rally. Then we moved on. We had US CPI, probably major event of the week. Um, CPI came in at 7%. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment and what that means and where it might go. But it was the highest reading in 39 years. Plenty of Fed speak this week, all queuing up for rate hikes. Seems like the doves are on board as well, which would mean March, they would pull the trigger when tapering, of course, is expected to, to finish at this point in time. On the other side of this, there's, there's not much panic in the oil market. Fourth weekly advance we're heading for, which would be the longest street since October. Um, kind of like what we've been talking about here as we've discussed Omicron, so forth, the analysts at Goldman Sachs saying early this week that demand impact from that variant has been modest. So amongst other things, oil is still tracking higher, we're up around 83 bucks a barrel at the moment. And then flipping to single stocks, Ford Motor. I mean, we've talked to EV a lot, Piers. We have. We haven't talked really about Ford Motor. And do you know how much Ford was up last year? Percentage. I, I actually do because... <clears throat> because I read your market maker email. Yeah. Uh, ev not, not, <laughs> not every day, most days, uh, 130, 132%. Yeah, you know, I give check take. opening rate every day, Piers. I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, but yeah, for, Ford, I mean, Tesla was up, I think it was 56% last year. Obviously, the SP yeah. was up 27. We're talking about 130 plus for Ford, yeah. and it kind of went about its business pretty discreetly. Um, but they this week hit a market value of 100 billion for the first time. Long story short, it's all about uh, them going EV and a full pivot in that direction. But away from there, we had bank earnings. They commenced today. So Friday, we we're recording this. And JP Morgan reported record annual profits, investment banking surging. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, has become the first to surpass Ten no. trillion dollars of assets under management. Wow, I was going to say nine trillion, but yeah, you just lose count. That's crazy, isn't it? Ten right. So, to put it in some context, uh, they've grown assets by fifteen percent in Q four. Q four. Right. Right. And that's now larger than the hedge fund, the VC, and the PE industry combined. 
just their growth in quarter four. The, the, the total. I think okay. Referring to yeah, I mean that is nine. Tr the ten trillion is more yeah. than yeah, okay. just insane. Those numbers. Um, and then yeah. Yeah, to, to kind of wrap wrap off the or wrap up the week, uh, aside from Boris, which we'll discuss, uh, no vax. Djokovic has obviously been in the in the news a lot. <laughs> and then you've got Prince Andrew. Yeah. Um, yeah, stripped He's of not his having a good titles. Time. That's not going to end well, uh, I fear, for Prince Andrew uh, at this point in time. Um, and then finally, got a shout out um, to my main man, Money Mayweather, and, and also Kim Kardashian. <laughs> uh, they've been sued. I don't know if you've read about this. I haven't. They've been sued over promoting the altcoin Ethereum Max as part of an alleged crypto scam, right? The scam, right. the major two points here of the scam, the, the main problem is Ethereum Max has absolutely nothing to do with Ethereum. Right. <laughs> part one. Um, and it's crashed 98% Ooh. since June which is when it was promoted by these two celebrities. Now, question for you. How much, well, there's two questions. First one, how much does Kim Kardashian get paid per <laughs> post on Instagram, US dollars? Wow. wow, that is a, God, that's, what, 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 how many followers has she got? A few, well, couple hundred million or something? I don't know how you want to work this out though. So let's go with well, I know, first, then you might can reverse well, it. My knowledge here on Insta's low. I'm going to start at a point that I do know. Ronaldo's the highest, and he's got 300 million followers. I think he broke 300 million in 300 million. Yeah, is that right? Anyway, so I'm, I'm going to wind that back. I reckon she's got 100 million. So a post per post, that's got to be a punt. That's you, you could charge a lot for that. Um, Ten million dollars. She was so. <laughs> so in terms of followers, I, I liked where you were heading. Now, if I yeah. was interviewing Piers Curran, I'd be like, "Okay, yeah, 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 I'm liking this. The logic is there." <laughs> Until the last um, bit, I said, which ruined it all. <laughs> <laughs> you had the job, then you blew it. <laughs> but the uh, so her followers, you're right. Uh, Ronaldo's up there, but she's very close. Uh, okay. As well, so she's on two hundred and seventy nine million right. followers. Yeah, and per post she gets eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars a post. That's... What you think she's low balling that? You think you should? Yeah. You, if you were her agent, you'd be saying, "Look, ten mil." If you want Kimmy to, I think she's low. I'm I'm going to stick to my gun. I think she's low balling <laughs> that. Okay. Let me let me let me. Look, my 15,000 oh, Twitter followers. I'll via, get up. <laughs> via what other channel could you access 280 million engaged followers? I, that's, I, I reckon she's low-balling that. Yeah. Okay. I'll send her a message. Yeah. I'll say you DM. send her a DM. <laughs> send her a DM. <laughs> All right. Well, Hit her up let, on the DMs. <laughs> well, let, let, let's um, let's get straight into it and talk about. Uh, I guess it's appropriate to start with the inflation numbers that will lead us into what the Fed speakers are kind of saying, and then the policy going forward. And so, US CPI is seven percent uh, in 2021, largest 12 months gain since 1982. Core prices biggest advance since 1991. Um, the increase in CPI led higher by prices in shelter and used vehicles, food contributed, but energy prices, which are a key driver in inflation, of course, through the predominant part of the year, fell last month. But looking at the price movement of oil, that's not shocking at all. Um, yeah. But bond markets are pricing in now 90% probability that the Fed will deliver four rate hikes now in 2022. And obviously their official communication is in their projections is three at this point in time. Um, thoughts on CPI first, and then we'll talk a little bit about what Powell said and what the rest of the gang at the Fed are saying. Yeah, it's 
Yeah, I think whilst obviously sensational headlines, 40-year highs, you know, 7% handle, um, that's kind of what was expected, though. So, I, you know, it's still, um, it's still more of the same, where the same is, oh, wow, that's, you know, inflation's high. Um, so I don't think it changes the Fed's, what is already a very aggressive hawkish pivot. I, obviously, it kind of it, it adds justification to their aggressive hawkish pivot, but it's too early still for inflation to start coming down, like naturally creeping back lower due to base effects. You know, part of the reason why it's high is because of base effects, and those base effects won't come out of the equation until we get into the spring. So it's not surprising. That inflation is still rising, um, but you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to suggest that it's not something we should be worried about because it definitely is. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think it's status quo where we were already in that position of inflation's high, the Fed's super hawkish, and, and we're still there. So, so perhaps the bigger talking point of what's happened this week is not so much the inflation figures, but it is the clarity that came by way of Jerome Powell, when he kind of alleviated what felt like anxiety that was resulting in this like surge in yields where we ended last week and is still kind of dominating the psyche a little bit, it feels at the moment. But he kind of, that was because it, markets were connecting this simultaneous trigger of policy events yeah Q tapering finishing rates rising and also the balance sheet reduction but he came out and said look that i've got it here he said it tends to take two to four meetings to work through the balance yeah. sheet decision now just looking at the timing of the fed meetings that wouldn't be much and then there's a gap, and I think it's May, is that that would be that meeting of three if you take the middle midpoint of that. So yeah, I, I, was that the, the key thing for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we talked about this in the podcast last week where maybe the markets have just gone, a, they've gone too far in pricing in the hawkish pivot. And maybe Jerome was listening in. Well, you know, Jerome, friend of the pod, uh was obviously listening in he thought oh, yeah i mean i love it when we go for an for a friday after work drink <laughs> with jerome powell and kim kardashian you know it's just, <laughs> just marriage made in heaven right there <laughs> um so i reckon he was he did he, yeah he, he did the right thing in his comments on on tuesday and just took that 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 ridiculous idea off the table which was in march they will hike rates and they'll start quantitative tightening at the same time. I mean, that's just in insanity land. Um, so yeah, he's pushed that out till, I mean, even I say pushing it out till June. So that's, I mean, even that's crazy. But um, yeah, so I think that's why you got that little bit of a bump um, higher perhaps on stocks. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a subtle difference. Look, we're still in the same, basically we're still in the same situation. Inflation is still really high. The Fed's still super hawkish compared to what they were a couple of months ago. And that's why, you know, in the end, you know, looking at things like the NASDAQ, fine, a little bit of upside briefly, but, you know, we're closing out the week on the lows. This is the lowest the NASDAQ index has been since the end of October. Um, so, you know, it's starting to, it's now, it's now you can say multi-month lows, right? Uh, we, haven't, we haven't been able to say that about stocks for, I mean, I don't know how long, actually. When, when were we last able to say stocks are making multi-month lows? Uh, I, I, you'd have to check, you'd have to fact check that, but it may well be more than 12 months. Um, well, it, it might not last for long because one of the recurring calls from the suits on Wall Street is Goldman Sachs, UBS, Global Wealth Management reiterated their bullish calls. They said... Equities can weather high interest rates and rising bond yields. BlackRock's Investment Institute recommended investors use sell-offs to add risk. And the perma balls that are JP Morgan Monday is, is, was arguably overdone, they said. And to be fair, very short term, 
they were they were right the following days um whether that will be right over the, a longer time period we'll see but yeah still seemingly keeping their heads f- fairly cool at the moment in terms of their view and, and i guess this was what a lot of the the banks were talking about at the end of last year you know even though we'll finish 2022 possibly higher which is the median kind of consensus on the street that's not without its drawdowns at some point and i guess you know this is a very well it's very minor at this point it's nothing to get too um deeply concerned about but is that just yeah i i i want to take you back to 20 and the 2015 for a good sort of comparison because what tends to happen is when the fed get hawkish markets don't like it and until we're confident enough that actually the economy's solid and strong and once we get our head to that point then actually hiking rates is fine Hmm. and then it becomes not oh my god they're hiking it just then becomes well how quickly are they going to hike right and so we just move forwards in the in the kind of narrative one step so at the end of 2015 um the fed went hawkish and they hiked um at the same time we had other issues as well there was a big concern around china um at that point through the summer of 2015 um and anyway we had a wobble and markets sold off into the end of 2015 and the start of 2016 um and then the, actually well i mean back then the fed held off a little bit on hiking more but then as we got to the end of 2016 they started hiking and they hiked four times in 2017 this idea of four hikes in a year everyone's going oh my god what that's but they hiked four times in 2017 you know, it's not so long ago. And the point is, how do equities react to hikes? It's entirely dependent on market sentiment, which is dependent on how solid is the economy below that. And if the economy is super strong, and if we're coming out of Omicron and you know, you're going to get some powerful economic momentum, well, then hikes are fine. Stocks can go up in a rate hiking cycle. Just go and have a look. Um, it's just we're in that transition at the moment between the pet, the Fed's hawkish pivot prior to the hike starting, and you've still got a bit of Omicron uncertainty in the mix and the supply chain and the inflation stuff. So it's all kind of in the melting pot. But I think that's why banks are pretty much happy to say, look, buy the dip, because they think we're going to get onto the, the hiking cycle and in previous cycles, as long as the economy is solid then it's fine. And, and if the economy is not solid, well, then the Fed won't hike. Hmm. Yeah. Unless, the, the unless we've got an inflation problem, <laughs> unless we've got stagflation, I'll just perhaps leave that on the table. That, that's your nightmare, hmm. where economy is slow and inflation stays high. But I, I can't, if COVID goes away, I can't quite see how that works. So I, I don't think that's a genuine risk. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, one thing that's happening today at the end of the week is that stocks are a little bit lower, but actually oil's firmly higher. Um, Yields at the moment haven't seen too much movement. We've been pretty much sideways for the last couple of days now. Um, So, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's, It's predominantly equities which are reflecting the anxiety to some extent at the moment. And yeah. I guess what you generally look for, though, is when there's a multi asset uniformity to movement, which is then something more substantial where equities could possibly then really roll over. But the other asset classes aren't really playing that tune at the moment. Yeah. What I will say on oil, what's really interesting on oil, certainly WTI crude at least, it's the October 21 high. We're right on it. And we've kind of been flirting with it for the last week or two but like powerful end to this week and we're pretty much right on their big level to look out for 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 you know let's say going into next week and let's say into the end of the month because you know can oil kick on to a hundred dollars is is the question and you've obviously got on the demand side omicron going away or at least proving to be milder and so if as long as economies you know, don't lock down, then obviously demand side, that's a positive factor. And, and if o- OPEC kind of stick to their current 
situation. And if you've got the other stuff, one-offs like, you know, Libyan production dropping and, and that kind of situation. And then you've got the medium term to long-term lack of um, investment into, you know, finding more supply, you know, in the end, that's the underlying slow burner that's driving this price up. And so I'm, I'm, I'm now in the, I'm now in the hundred dollar camp for 22. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, I know you're heavily invested in oil infrastructure and oil uh, pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, talk, talking my own book. What, what, do you, what do you mean? Um, okay. Well, look, let, let, let's move away from, from there and let's talk a little bit about UK politics and Boris Johnson, because it's been a, a hell of a week um, for Bojo under pressure from senior Tories, of course, after he admitted the drinks party at number 10 garden on the 20th of May, 2020, when, as you can remember, we were all in lockdown. <laughs> and so being defiance of his own government's rules, uh, the FT reported earlier in the week, that MP said letters of no confidence were starting to be handed in and, and, and just a little bit of understanding of how that actually works. So, Graham Brady, the chair of the Tory backbench 1922 committee. I think mean, if you're an American trying to understand UK Parliament, even just <laughs> understanding the Lords and what, what, what are they wearing and what are they doing and just the, just the noises that come out of parliamentary debate. But so there's this backbench and actually as unimportant as that sounds, it's very important, the backbenchers. It's kind of like where the power kind of truly comes from and essentially then the chair of the backbench committee there's there, there's a set number that you need to have which is a total of 54 letters so 15 percent of Tory MPs would have to then put in this call of no confidence for a vote then to happen and as many as 30 letters of no confidence have been submitted is what they were saying early in the week so the, the kind of key figures 54 at around 30 which is Quite high, actually. But yeah. actually, I'd say the closer you get, the, the the more that kind of value of that one vote accounts for much more. There's always going to be like very out out there candidates who, yeah. at a drop of a hat, cast a no confidence. Yeah. It's really the deciding ones. And as we'll talk about, it's the cabinet. The cabinet is key. If you yeah. lose your cabinet, you're out. Basically, yeah, you have no support. So the prime minister's approval rating. It's falling dramatically. It's been going that way for some time. Uh, there was a YouGov poll that came out for the Times on Wednesday night, I think it was. Labour now have a 10-point lead over the Tories for the first time in nearly a decade. So it's been 10 years. It Basically, he's his approval rating is falling as fast and it's almost as low as Theresa May <laughs> <laughs> at the end of her premiership. Um, and one of the things that you generally start to see in politics is it's very seldom the fact that once this decline happens in confidence it it doesn't really change you yeah. might be able to stabilize stop the rot but you can never reclaim former glory really and and obviously he's gone through a, a sequence of different uh, events so yeah feel free to jump in but there's a couple of really interesting points that came out of a um an article out of the spectator who are uh, I guess for a lot of particularly students, you might not follow the, the spectator. And definitely one thing I'd say, um, if if you're going into a global markets division type role, of which could be a, quite a wide variety of positions, you really should have a base competency knowledge of certainly if you're based in London, UK political system structure and, and the US, because obviously it's midterms that ends the year. So if you're not comfortable with, the differences of the two and the structure and how they operate just spend honestly like an afternoon on each one just reading online about it in terms of just hit wiki and stuff like that to get an understanding of structure it will hold you in good stead because lo and behold i can tell you what they'll be talking about at the beginning of november of this year yeah because it's a set political event right so and that will dictate lots of different things so just a word to the wise, just make sure you get that down. But going back to this article, they were saying a couple of things. Um, what was striking about the Tory rebellion against vaccine passports, for instance, was how many of the rebels had backed 
Johnson in the 2019 leadership context uh, contest. He has alienated allies and his enemies as they are, they're already lying in wait for the best moment to strike. So you've already lost those because it's never fully favorable when you come in, unless you're Tony Blair back in 1997. Call me Tony. <laughs> um, then, you've got, then you've got what is the issue? I thought this was an interesting point. Party gate, let's call it party gate. It's not a complex issue. Yeah. And so even if Sue Gray, who's uh, the person investigating this to find out, has he done something wrong? Is it criminal and so forth? Um, she sets out the facts and the response from the public is obviously very key for confidence. And it's an issue that everyone can understand because there are many things that Boris has done in his um, leadership where it's so integral to the, just the complication of like Brexit and things like that. You wouldn't really understand it because it's yep. just boring and it's just of not of interest. But when it comes to like what the media are doing, which is the queen sitting solo when yeah. she wasn't there and you know, all these different sorts of things, it's going to resonate. And that's a massive problem because this is all about optics. Um, the ironic thing is the improving outlook for COVID, which you rightly said, he kind of called it right. Ironically, that's changing the calculus for some Tory MPs because that was a risk of calling a leadership context contest who would want to do it when there's such uncertainties but really? actually yeah, we're getting emerging clarity coming which is giving more greater conviction that look that's not so much of an issue now because hopefully boosters and the natural way of which waves get less potent over time well then that's not so much of an issue so yeah it's interesting how that's changed and shifted um there's now a sense that with the virus in retreat, all restrictions likely to be lifted later this month, it might be possible to do some, you know, change horses, so to speak, and who you're backing in that respect. The crucial difference between now and the first phase of the premiership, and this was another interesting point. If you think about when he came in, you needed, you needed Boris to do two things. You needed him to get Brexit done and you needed him to beat Jeremy Corbyn. And for that purpose, he was probably... A very good fit. He smashed but, it on that front, <laughs> on those two fronts. If that, right. yeah. But that meant they were backers within the party were prepared to overlook, right, some of these circumstances because he was the man for the job to win on those two fronts. However, they've kind of the, the narrative shifted, and the tolerance is gone now. Yeah, and the incidents have become multiple. Um, and then added to this argument that Johnson's departure would allow Tories, this is another important thing about the management of the party after Boris. And yeah, this is a good point. It's that, that if the Tories as a party now use him as the scapegoat to some degree, well, they could argue they understand the uh, anger over hypocrisy, the sense that there's you know, one rule for those in power, that's not for the others. It's like, yes, we understand Boris needs to go. And so therefore you give a clean, fresh slate within the same leading party in yeah. that sense, which makes sense of strategy. So um, yeah, timing wise, um, the thing that, the reason why this might not happen immediately, and obviously very telling that Rishi, Rishi decided not to be around for Wednesday when he was getting a grilling and PMQs about all this. Yeah. And then he, I think he tweeted at like 8 p.m. in the evening, kind of half-heartedly backing him. So the talk is, obviously, is Rishi going to do it? He's the favourite. But timing is key. It always is. And there's local elections happening in May in yeah. the UK. So um, I would say the likelihood is that nothing's going to happen probably until then. And I, re I remember Theresa May, it was all going terribly. And then she had the European MEPs, wasn't it? And I think the Tories came like fourth or fifth. Yeah, that's right. Um, and when it's like a, an official, formal, democratic process like that, there's no, yeah. there's no gray area. Of what, yeah, was I at a party? Was I not? Did I, you know, was it this or that? And it's like, no, you are now not a vote winner. Right. And so now you go. Yeah. And for Rishi, if I think about May, Bank of England might have got another hike in. The Fed have got some clarity. 
Omicron's now, you know, where are we at there? Perhaps better position. Economy's moved on a bit. Just wait. You know, this is all about let him self implode. <laughs> Don't force yourself. And then it will happen. But, you know, you know what these politicians are like. Have they got patience? I'm not sure. They're all power hungry animals, aren't they? I mean, I like your thesis. Um, you're mentioning the spectator. I won't say much on this other than the spectator. You know, Boris was the editor <laughs> of the spectator before he became a, uh, an MP. Did you know that? He's got a bit of a track record on lying as well. Because you know what he said to the spectator? The condition was you can only become editor if you don't run to become an MP. He said, yep, yeah, deal. So then he became editor. And then he went and ran to become an MP. <laughs> uh, um, so he's got a bit of he's got a bit of a his. I guess he's got a history of lying. Is is the point? And here we are again with him lying. Um, but as you definitely you're, you're spot on with the fact that it's much more relatable for the electorate. This story partying during lockdown when everyone else isn't allowed to party, isn't allowed to go to funerals, you know, aren't, you can't go to weddings or this kind of stuff. That's going to piss people off. And I think you're right, timing-wise, only when it's the evidence is at the polling ballot, at the polling booths in May, if that's a car crash of a, of a regional election, then, yeah, I think that's your moment for Rishi to, to ride in. Um, so, so Boris has got four months to turn it around and can't quite see what's on the slate for him to be able to do that. I mean, I think the uh, we've got this meeting or, or this announcement at the end of the month on restrictions. And I think I think those are going for sure. In Boris's self-interest, he'll need to get rid of as many restrictions as possible to try and get some of those more right wing conservatives. You know, can he save the relationship with any of those or not? Um, but yeah, you you probably say the writing's probably on the wall now yeah. for Boris. So I guess, I guess a, a point of clarity for those that aren't familiar with how this really works. So when you hear a poll and the poll is suggestive of Labour like in its best position in 10 years, how are you to actually take that? Because just want to make clear this doesn't mean that labor now rides in and like storms no. the palace this is not how it works i go as far as to say that's irrelevant yeah. other than maybe it persuades rishi to 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 go for a leadership challenge it's irrelevant with regards to who's going to govern this country because the conservatives have a huge majority and the next general election is not for three and, and a half years labor will not get into power until at the earliest, I think it's May 2025, right? Um, or no, I might, sorry, no. 2022, uh, I think it is. We'll have to check. No, hang on. When was the last general election? Boris won in, uh, was it end of 2019? Uh, we'll have to yeah, it's 2019, five years. Yeah, um, it was a winter election for the first time. In, yeah, so right, fine. Winter 2024, right? So, you know, we're mid-cycle. Uh, and yeah, sure, the polls are going to go up and down, Labour versus Conservative. But at, the, at this point in the s political cycle, it's not it's not relevant from who's going to run the country point of view. It's purely just down to who's going to be the head of the Conservative Party. And can Boris cling on and somehow come back from come back from the from the ashes, or, or will is it time step aside and 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 maybe a, maybe a Rishi might might come in. I was just saying, what a ride for Rishi. I mean, until yeah. he appeared, I can't remember what it was. I think, I think Boris was so ahead at the time of, I can't remember what was happening. It was almost like it was a shoe in There's no point Boris turning up to some of these TV debates. So he sent Rishi out. And it's like, who's this Rishi Sunak? Yeah. And this was like two and a bit years ago. Yeah. I mean, incredible. It's been a meteoric rise. Um, so what, and he's so, young as well. I mean, he, he's very young. I, I don't know how old is he, and would he would he be the youngest prime minister for 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 
many a year. Well, maybe since... Well, I think maybe... Well, he's 41. I'm not sure how old Cameron was when he came in. I thought Cameron was a bit younger than that. Was he younger than that? Um, I think it's close. It's got to be close. Well, look, I mean, Rishi's highly relatable as ever. I mean, uh, the, you know, in, married into a billionaire family. So just like every one of us. <laughs> um, so it's great to have another representative of the, the people of Britain. But uh, <laughs> um, I guess moving back to markets. Yeah. Rishi coming in. I mean, let's just say he does in, say, the summer. Let's just right. pick a timeline. Does that have any implications? Um, for markets, I don't think so. No. I mean, I don't think it particularly... Because you're not getting a... It's just a change in leadership, like, within the party, right? And, okay, I know that means a new prime minister because they're the governing party, but from a policy point of view certainly from an economic policy point of view. I mean, <laughs> Rishi's the chancellor. So if he becomes the prime minister, then from an economic policy point of view, there's going to be no change. So, so therefore, from a market's point of view, I don't, I don't really see that being an influencing factor of note. Would yeah, be my guess, initial um, actually, through some of the recent uh, COVID decisions, Rishi's always kind of sat more on the looser restrictions and reopen faster side. And if Omicron yeah. does prove to be more mild, it's probably even more optimal in that sense because he's more coming from the treasury, so economy focused. Yeah. Um, time will tell. Yeah. All right. Well, look, we'll wrap it up there. And just to conclude then, as I was saying, the next episode is number 50. So to fulfill on our pledge to empower you, our community, particularly students looking to kind of find their, their future in, in finance, whatever that might be, what we're going to do for the 50th episode is I want people to email me directly. My email is a.chung, so a.chung at amplifytrading.com. And I want you to tell me out of the 50 episodes, you can throw in as well the additional career hack ones that we did. What was your favorite episode and why? And the one who can give the most convincing argument, should we get them on the pod? Let's get to, them on. To promote themselves? I was yeah. going to say, what we were going to do was I was going to give you the shout out. We know we have some of our corporate clients as well who listen to this podcast channel. And I was going to, promote you basically and say you're the best candidate and, and give me the skinny and I'll, I'll give you the shout out and, and get you some coverage but i think we should get them let's on. get them on let's give them the stage let's yeah. do it all right so if you want to come on the next episode <laughs> number 50 hit me on the email a.chung amphitrain.com and the three of us will we'll get it on let's do it all right cool. and we'll and we'll, just before we go Will no Vax Djokovic be still in the draw for the Australian Open whilst we do the 50th episode in a week's time? Yes or no? I know you're a fan, so I'm interested on your angle here. Should he play or not? Um, if he does play, he'll win the whole thing. Yeah. Because... So Purely on the basis, not because he's the best player in the world. I mean, yes, he'll win because of that. But because he's the sort of guy where yeah. I would imagine... You'll be angry. He, he gets so much hate. Yeah. He, he has only, I think, achieved the type of consistent success that he's had by using that hate in a very positive way, which is to dominate his sport. Yeah. And he will be... I'm going to say it as much as it pains me. He will be the greatest tennis player that has ever lived because he's going to win more than 21, which will take him to the top of the grand slams. The guy's going to win 25 plus, And then it's not even a so, conversation so, piece. So, so far you've dodged the question. He's going to play. He's going to win. Do you think he should play? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. There you go. I, I just needed to hear it. I had to squeeze it out. Yeah. No, no he shouldn't. No. Yeah. Right. Good. 
We've right, sat come on, on Andy. Let's go. <laughs> well, I don't know how he did, actually. He got to the semi-finals of the Sydney tournament. Yeah. First time he's won three in a row, ATP level, since 2019 or something like that. So, you never know. Dark horse. Doubtful. I'm not sure. English sport in Australia at the moment is not going so well. So, All right. Well, on that note, have a great weekend, Piers and everyone. Yeah. Take care. See you guys. All right. See you later.